Perfect. Thank you very much. So, well, welcome back, everyone. Um, Coralia is an associate professor in numerical optimization in the Mathematical Institute at the University of Oxford since 2013. And she's also a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science since 2016. She has previously held several academic and research positions, including the University of Edinburgh and uh, Cambridge. And her re research interests focus on uh, nonlinear optimization algorithms, analysis and implementation, especially on uh, com complexity, global rates of convergence, and also applications of optimizations from climate modeling to signal processing and machine learning. Today, she'll be, she will be talking about optimization methods for non-convex stochastic problems. And I'm really interested to, to hear her talk. Thank you. Thank you so much for this uh, invitation. Um, and I hope everyone is well in these uh, challenging times. And I am delighted that the school went ahead um, despite the current uh, situations. Um, so I'm an optimizer um, and that has been kind of my, my, my training. Um, and today what I would like to talk about is the power of um, and virtues of classical optimization methods for non-convex problems and how this could uh, be uh, applied to modern context of stochastic optimization. What do they have to offer? What, are, what is their, um, uh, yeah, their power and strength? So, so that's kind of my, my, uh, my angle here. Uh, in my talk today. Um, and a lot of this uh, work is joined with uh, Katja Scheinberg, um, and then we have two collaborators, uh, Jose Blanchett, who helped us with some of the probability aspects of the work, and Matt uh, Manichelli. And some of the numerics uh, that I will talk about at the end are with my, uh, with one of my students, Alex uh, Puyu. Um, in the beginning of this talk, I will just give a generic introduction to non-convex optimization and what are the, the methods that, that we use and, and um, what do they, uh, what are their key points and what they can achieve and not, they cannot. And then I will go more towards stochastic problems. So in, in non-convex optimization, um, what we know how to do well is to find local solutions, local minimizers of non-convex landscapes when, when the function f is smooth. Now here, for simplicity, I talk about the unconstrained case, um, the unconstrained case of minimizing a, a function f, um, where f could be non-convex. You just don't know if it's convex or not, basically. And n could be large, the number of variables. Uh, this area is also well developed for finding constrained sol uh, solutions. So when there are restrictions present on the variable x, okay, uh, but that's a uh, whole, uh, whole other talk. So I will just restrict here to the unconstrained case. And this kind of landscape, they come in, in all uh, shapes and sizes. And here are two uh, uh, um, well-known test functions. It could be a landscape that could have many local solutions, or it could be one that has just one uh, stationary point, one critical point, that's also the global solution, but it lies in this banana shaped valley. So in, in fact, they can be um, anything. So how could we design methods and what can methods uh, achieve? So in the beginning, as I said, I will talk about deterministic derivative based optimization just for context. What is the, what do we know about their global rates of convergence? Um, this is just a summary of existing work. Then I will talk about uh, methods. How do we extend these methods pretty much as they are to the context of having just probabilistic information about the function uh, uh, rather than the objective function that we are trying to minimize rather than exact derivatives and function values. Um, and then I will uh, finish with some numerical results. So. We minimize a, non, uh, a possibly uh, non-convex function that's smooth, and I will denote the gradient in this way, the standard notation, and second derivatives or Hessian matrix uh, in this way. Okay, so I differentiate f, which may depend on n variables, um, and and what we know is that at a local solution, the gradient uh, is zero, and we have this local convexity. So for this reason, we want to use derivatives in 
in when we when we generate an algorithm for for solving this problem so we want to use them both to advance in the algorithm and to characterize optimality so when we have a a small gradient we know that we are close to a stationary point and when we have uh, we look at the eigenvalues of the hessian matrix if we see that they are all positive uh, or non-negative we know that we are close to a local minimizer um, derivative based methods can start from any guess of the solution this is one of their uh, strengths that you can give the, the the software the algorithm any initial guess x0 um, and uh, it will generate iterates that are uh, better and better approximations to a stationary point of the function, ideally a local minimizer. And how do they do that? The idea is simple. You approximate at the current guess of the solution xk, you approximate this unknown complicated function f by a simple model. Uh, usually, if you have derivatives, a linear or quadratic Taylor model. And instead of minimizing this, uh, no, this complicated function f, you minimize locally this simple model, linear or quadratic model. So you generate an improved guess of your solution by minimizing this local model to get this change, sk, that uh, uh, um, stands for the, the gap between you know, xk and your next iterate xk plus 1, an improved guess of your solution. And then when you observe that you obtain a small gradient and maybe if you afford, can afford to calculate, say, uh, or approximate the smallest eigenvalue of your second derivatives, then you know that you are close to a, um, a solution, a local solution, and you terminate the algorithm. Now, if we did this, would, we, um, would this be enough? So first of all, let me just clarify, what is a linear Taylor model? So a linear Taylor model would be something like this. So my local model would be just f at xk plus this linear term involving the gradient. If I had a quadratic Taylor model, I would have a second derivative term. A linear model, if I minimize that to get the change sk, so I minimize this model subject to some normalization of the step, I would get the steepest descent, a gradient method. Okay, I would get gradient descent method. Okay. If I minimize a quadratic model, Taylor model, I get a Newton direction or a Newton-like direction, a second order method. Okay. Now, if I just did that, I just calculated my step by minimizing these local models, would this be enough to give me a convergent method? The answer is no, not from an arbitrary starting point. So to ensure that these methods advance um, uh, appropriately to a local solution, from an arbitrary starting point, this is what I mean by globally. Globally, it just means to a local solution, but from an arbitrary starting point, we need to safeguard this step. And so we have a few ways to essentially generate convergent methods uh, for non-convex optimization. And I will briefly just go through them. This may be known stuff for some people, but maybe not for everybody. So I thought maybe it's worthwhile I just briefly describe how to, how to generate a convergent method typically when you have derivatives. So after you calculated your direction sk, in a line search framework, you just cut this direction sk by a scalar alpha k that we call step size or line search in optimization. In machine learning people call it a learning rate. All right. So you just cut this step so as to um, somehow, either by directly evaluating f or by some prior knowledge, you know that this value of alpha k that you choose gives you some sufficient decrease in f. All right. So for example, if you want to predefine it so that you don't have to evaluate f at the current step, you have a const, then you need to know something about the Lipschitz constant of the gradient, if that, such a constant exists. But this is not used in general in non-convex optimization because you don't know this Lipschitz constant and it's expensive to evaluate it a priori typically. So in, in non-convex optimization, this choice of learning rate is adaptive. And basically what you try to do is you, you evaluate f at various trial points so as to make sure that the decrease in f is proportional to the decrease that you would obtain if you minimize the model, the local model. Your step, sk minimizes a local model so you just try to mimic 
in F a multiple of this uh, uh, model decrease. If you obtain that, then then you choose uh, that trial step as your next uh, iterate. And this is the, the standard for nonlinear software, nonlinear, you know, if you look at software packages for nonlinear non-convex optimization, this would be a standard uh, approach. Here I just plotted on Rosenbrock function that we saw in the beginning, the valley, the banana shaped valley with the problem with just one stationary point. What happens if you apply gradient descent to it? And what happens if you apply Newton? Because this problem is well conditioned, this, this narrow valley amounts to an ill conditioned problem. First order methods, gradient methods are slow, even close to the solution. Second order methods are fast. So, so this is just to illustrate that, that first order methods are very prone typically uh, to be affected by the conditioning of the problem. They are very sensitive to the conditioning of the problem. In this problem is badly conditioned, but not terribly badly conditioned. And still, uh, um, Stiebel's descent, uh, though in theory it converges, in practice, uh, the ill conditioning makes it very slow. So it converges in theory, but with a slow rate, and in practice, numerical accumulation of errors just make it to boil down, to break down. Um, second order has this effect that is not affected by uh, scaling of the problem, and so uh, it's not affected by this uh, uh, conditioning around the uh, solution. Of course, second order methods are more expensive, so that's the downside. Um, okay, so these are kind of typical, typical behaviors. What about trust region methods? Uh, well, how do they differ? It's just another way to, to ensure convergence of a method. Uh, compared to line search, but it has some advantages. So, so um, what do we say? We say that instead of cutting the step by a fixed fraction, we are going to minimize the model in a region, in a ball. Here's in the picture, you can see, you can see uh, in blue here, especially the, the quadratic model of a uh, overlaid on some other example of a non-convex function. It's a quadratic model and I have here in um, in blue is my base iterate xk, and I have a trust region ball uh, on which I minimize my model, over which I minimize my model. So instead of doing an unconstrained minimization of uh, this quadratic model, I do a constrained one over a ball constraint. Uh, the advantage is that second order non-convex local models, right, uh, are, you are able to minimize those models without any problem over this uh, ball constraint. The, the model is always, uh, the, 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 the step minimization is always well defined. So let me just step back a little bit. If I have, uh, um, I want to use second order models because we know they are very efficient in practice. However, if you want to reflect local curvature of your landscape, you don't always want to use, to, to, to have a uh, second derivatives that's positive definite. If you do, great, you can take a Newton-like step and get descent. But if you don't have local convexity, what are you going to do? Trust region framework allows a very natural way to deal with local non-convex quadratic models uh, because it gives you automatically a, a, a well-defined subproblem um, in that case and a way to solve this subproblem efficiently even to global optimality. I don't have time to talk about this, but it's just a natural way. And we will see that for stochastic problems, this trust region uh, can act as a, as a good region for sampling your points as well. And then uh, what we do is we say, we just, we don't have a line search anymore. We just trial the, the full step, the full minimization, uh, minimizer of the sub problem. Uh, and if, uh, if F, again, similar principle, if the, the decrease in the function at the trial step agrees with the model decrease, we take the step. Otherwise, we reject the step and we shrink the trust region. Um, and that's how we evolve. So automatic adaptation of uh, this algorithm parameter delta k. We can start with any value for it in the algorithm, like one, or you can make it a bit more informed on the problem parameters. Regularization methods, yet another way to uh, uh, to deal with uh, non-convex uh, uh, local uh, second-order models, but not only. Um, 
this leads to unconstrained subproblems regularized by a uh, weight here. You can have other powers than three, but three is special. Three is special when you have a second order model here because we, I will say in a moment, it gives the best complexity for non-convex optimization. So you calculate the step by this regular, from this regularized subproblem and then use similar methodologies as before uh, for trust region and line search in terms of advancing, uh, taking the step or not taking the step. Uh, he, we, we, you know, regularization, um, ha we found it to be more efficient than trans region very often, uh, but I would say that uh, is kind of implementation dependent, it's definitely competitive with trans region. Um, and it would say, I would say that it's more beneficial, uh, especially when you have additional constraints because there's a problem for the step is unconstrained. I can talk more about this. So there are some issues with trust region when you add additional uh, constraints, but these are overcome by regularization. So what do we know about log global rates of convergence of these methods? And this is what I've spent a lot of my life doing. Under just smoothness assumptions on the Lipschitz, uh, on the Lipschitz uh, 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 smoothness assumptions on F, so either gradient is Lipschitz continuous or Hessian is Lipschitz continuous, we can guarantee that the gradient, that these methods drive the gradient of F below epsilon uh, and ensure some second order criticality condition if they can calculate second order information in uh, at most this many iterations. So for steepest descent is at most epsilon to minus two, and there is no second order guarantees, but you only need the gradient to be Lipschitz continuous. For Newton with classical trust region and line search as described, it's again epsilon to minus two for first order guarantees and epsilon to minus three halves for second order. Cubic regularization was the first method as first proposed by Nesterov and Poyok, and we've uh, made it kind of more, uh, uh, we've developed more sort of practical variants of cubic regularization with same complexity guarantees. The complexity is epsilon to minus three halves. And this is a, an optimal uh, complexity bound for second order methods. Um, you cannot do better uh, under uh, just first and second order information and smoothness of the Hessian. And then variants of a trust region line search appeared, uh, were developed that have the same complexity. Uh, they are more involved than uh, cubic regularization uh, variants typically as, as in terms of algorithms, but still they have the same uh, complexity. Okay, this is what we know about uh, global methods, uh, sorry, about uh, classical non-convex optimization methods. What is the downside of these methods? They, the, sorry, the, the plus side is that they are mature techniques. We understand them well, both from the theory and the numerical uh, point of view. In many ways, if somebody asks me, what's a good method to try, my, to try on my algorithm from the non-convex library, I would say, go to LBFGS. So it uses, a pro, it uses a gradient, exact gradients and function values, but not exact derivatives. Um, and it's it's very efficient. Of course, if you have exact second derivatives, uh, you can get better uh, efficiency. And they can be applied to large scale problems, maybe not quite on the scale of machine learning, but still it, you can apply them typically to oscillatory landscapes that are of, of large sizes. And there is good software out there. Unfortunately, they require exact function values and at least first derivative, accurate first derivatives. If you, if your uh, problem allows you to do accurate finite differencing, you can use this software and you should use these methods because they will be just as efficient. If, if you can afford to do finite differencing, say for gradients, this, this software will be fine. If you can't, or if the problem is somehow too large for, for you to be able to do it, you, this will, these methods you cannot use as they are. So we need something else. There, there is a, uh, an area called derivative free optimization. And if your problem is not too large, you should go and use that software. That software will not find a difference your, your function value and it can be applied to stochastic methods. And the software is very, very powerful. And it's typically uh, based on trust region methods. Um, the downside is it's only for about a hundred variables. So what do you do? What do you do 
if you have a huge scale problem, it's stochastic and you have inexact problem information. In particular, things like machine learning problems. What do you do? I don't want to spend a lot of time describing things that you are very familiar with. So, so basically, just I will just mention simply, uh, say, supervised learning problems, where what you have is you have a set of data points and you want to label them in, say, two groups. Uh, and you want to find the best way to separate these two groups by finding a hyperplane. So given W, W is the data, X is the vector I want to find. Okay, I want to find X such that, for example, I make the smallest number of mistakes uh, when I classify this point on a given uh, data set. That's just linear classification, but of course you could have some other nonlinear function here uh, that you're trying to find. So you could minimize uh, this uh, expected or empirical error, right, to select a classifier, for example, by minimizing the average number of mistakes that one makes. But this is complicated because I don't know that I may not know the distribution of my data points. So instead of, of doing what I would like to do, which is to solve this stochastic problem, one transforms it into a, an empirical risk so that one has a sum of terms here instead of an integral. Um, so I uh, over a finite training set, so I want to minimize the number of errors I make here rather than on the whole uh, set. However, this is a non-smooth problem because I have here an indicator function. So usually people transform this into a smooth problem. So by uh, smoothing out this, uh, this uh, step function by uh, uh, using, say, an empirical loss function. So we end up with, with this well-known form of uh, a sum of functions that are smooth for which I want to find uh, uh, the parameter x. So I use x because I want to keep consistency of notation with what I said earlier. So usually we have uh, x is of large dimensions and we typically treat a deterministic formulation, though if we are honest, this formulation comes from a stochastic problem, right? So in fact, what I would really like to do is to minimize the expected loss. All right, so, so this is kind of the standard, uh, the standard form here, that I have a sum of functions, uh, possibly and ideally uh, uh, in a stochastic uh, sense. So we have the well-known stochastic gradient uh, where instead of solving, I cannot afford to calculate the full gradient typically, so I just calculate a subset of the gradient, a batch a size gradient, so just a subset of the terms, uh, the gradient of the terms uh, fi that I have, and then I take uh, typically just the steepest descent step uh, for this batch gradient with some predefined uh, learning rate. Okay, and one commonly assumes that in expectation, uh, this uh, this uh, uh, batch gradient is an unbiased estimator of the true gradient. Now, what did we propose? We proposed to use adaptive methods, similar to classical methods. Uh, so basically, we propose to adapt the, the size of the batch, SK, to vary the learning rate. The learning rate, the step size alpha k, to vary it uh, in, a, in a way uh, uh, like classical methods, to include curvature, to allow for curvature, to allow bias estimates, and still be able to give complexity guarantees. Okay, um, so now I will go into what we propose. So these are methods with probabilistically accurate uh, uh, models. So first, I will assume that I have accurate function evaluations but I have inaccurate derivatives. Okay, so in the classical framework that I started with, what I will, pro what I will propose is that these models that I have, right? I started with these linear or quadratic local models that were based on Taylor. Now assume that they are sufficiently good just with a certain probability. So instead of, instead of saying, even that I have accurate gradients every so often, which you could, even those gradients can be inaccurate as long as they are kind of in a sufficient sense, right? But even that property of sufficiently accurate gradients, for example, is only true with a certain probability. 
okay? So, for example, this could be the case where my local models come from random sampling of function values within a ball around the current point. Or, for example, think of this framework where I calculate my uh, gradients by finite differencing of function values, and each finite difference is calculated by a different processor, for example. So I send this to, a, to different processors, my, my finite, I send one finite difference to different processors, and then I have a master processor that collects all these finite differences and forms my gradient. Now, assume I have processor failure. Should I wait for that finite difference, or should I just continue with whatever I've received back from my different uh, workers? Um, so here, this framework will allow a lot of processor failure. And it will tell you, yes, you should just continue without accurate information, without waiting for those failed finite differences. Um, it also applies to stochastic gradient with varying batch size and, and step size. So we will see that the batch size will be uh, inversely proportional to uh, the size of the trust region, for example. Okay, um, so you, it will adapt to the local landscape. Okay, we have a generic framework that can incorporate classical lines or trust region cubic regularization. And I will want to answer a complexity question. What is the expected number of iterations of such frameworks generate a true sufficiently small gradient? I never see or can calculate these gradients, but can, can they actually do it? So here's my framework. In these models from before, where I had here a true gradient and true Hessian, now I'm going to have something approximate that will approximate my true gradient and my true Hessian, where this approximation only holds with a certain probability p conditioned on the past iterates. If I don't know, so in my algorithm, I will have no idea when I have a good model or a bad model. So I call such an iteration where I have a good model, a true iteration, and otherwise I have a false iteration. Now, the rest of the algorithm is exactly like trust region methods before. I mean, I calculate my step and then I adjust my trust region. In this first framework I'm talking about, F is accurate. All right, so I can measure progress in F. Right, now the algorithm is stochastic. It's a stochastic process and I have re re realizations of it. And I have different types of iterations. Before I had, I could only have success when I make progress in F or unsuccess for iteration when I don't make progress in F. Now, this can be of two more types, when I have a good model or a bad model. What can we guarantee about trust region? This is a classical trust region framework. So even if I had exact derivatives, I would not expect a better complexity than epsilon to minus two. It's just classical trust region. What we can guarantee is that in, I can recover this complexity. So F has just Lipschitz gradient. Um, this probabilistic trust region can be guaranteed to drive the true gradient below epsilon in at most the many expected number of steps. Um, epsilon to minus two, okay, times the distance to the solution as it's common, times some constants that depend on the Lipschitz uh, constant of the gradients and some algorithm parameters times a constant factor that depends on the probability of the model being good. And this constant factor here is, the only condition on it is obviously that P is greater than a half, strictly. So P is greater than a half, so more than half the time, strictly, I have to see good models. If more than half the time I see good models, I have a convergent algorithm with probability one and with the same complexity as classical methods, right? So this these classical frameworks, because they are adaptive, they can tolerate a huge amount of error. I have not required anything about having an unbiased error. This allows bias. On the, on the iteration when the model is bad, it can be arbitrarily bad. Can we have a uh, cubic regularization frameworks? Yes. We can have cubic regularization frameworks with uh, epsilon to minus three halves complexity and under similar assumptions that, that these models have to be accurate, but to second order uh, more than half the time. 
um, if you want different guarantees here to be more, uh, so, so this probability here with greater than a half correlates with how you increase and decrease the trust region. So in this case, you have to, to increase it and decrease it by, uh, so, so decrease it by half and increase it by two. So there is a correlation between the term, the factors by which you increase and decrease, but you can change those and then you can adjust this probability here. So what, how can I generate such, um, how can I generate such probabilistic uh, models? So um, we can do uh, batch samplings. We can do batch sampling. Um, so for example, we can do stochastic gradient and batch sampling. We can have this kind of conditions, all right? Uh, um, so we can require that this would fit in our framework that the batch gradient is close to uh, the true gradient by a multiple uh, of the batch gradient, okay? Uh, where this multiple here in our context is just a multiple of, uh, uh, the, of alpha k. And so I'm contrasting here with the framework from Nosedal. Their, their framework requires a fixed mu and so on. Our framework here has an adaptive mu uh, and has this batch size here and allows non-convex f and all sorts of other uh, adjustments. And this kind of condition is only required to hold with a certain probability. So for the batch gradient, for the batch gradient, this is the kind of condition you would require and then the framework would apply. Um, if you want to, to view it, if you, if you um, uh, assume that you have an unbiased uh, estimator so that, that the batch gradient is unbiased, then our framework translates to a stochastic gradient with second order information, for example, uh, where you require that um, that the batch size SK is sufficiently large, greater than one over a power of the trust region delta K. So it automatically adjusts to the local landscapes, the local landscape. You have to require finite variance. We just did very simple calculations uh, to show how you can, and this is all in the papers that we have, um, how you can translate these frameworks to have um, a probability greater than a half um, if SK is sufficiently large. So it's not dependent on epsilon. It's dependent on this constant delta, on this algorithm parameter delta K that can become close to epsilon in the run of the algorithm, but it's not uh, so early on. So it allows actually smaller batch sizes early on. Um, or you can do um, methods based on uh, a sampling of function values and you would sample your gradient within uh, a, a um, trust region uh, of size delta k that then adjusts. So the trust region will, would have two roles in this uh, kind of algorithmic frameworks. The role of um, the role of um, uh, ensuring convergence of the method and measuring progress, but also a sampling region. So we have a very general framework, basically. Right, you can do second order models and so on. I, I'm not going to, uh, the slides are available. I don't need to detail all this right now. Uh, basically, you can do first, second order methods, um, and you can sample first gradients and second derivatives, right. So, so now I will drop also in my frameworks exact function values. So now I will go to true stochastic optimization where both derivatives are inexact and uh, function values. But I will skip this idea of probabilistic models. And now I will add probabilistic function values. Right. So I have a, I assume that I have an underlying smooth landscape. I still need this assumption, but what I observe is noisy observation. So the landscape is corrupted uh, or it's, 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 it's noisy. Okay, so what I have is noisy observations of this or evaluations of this landscape. I'm going to stick to the trust region framework here. Um, so what we have is that we have these probabilistic models, local models, just like before. So inexact gradients, inexact uh, Hessians, with a certain probability, okay, p. 
So with a certain probability, they are good estimates of the true derivatives. And that, that, that's all I know. And on top of that, I will assume that I have estimates of f that are sufficiently accurate in this sense, okay, in the trust region, uh, as a multiple of the trust region size with the probability q. So these properties also don't hold on every iteration. Um, they only hold with a certain probability q. So my models are good instead in the sense of being sufficiently close say, to two Taylor ones with probability p. My function evaluations are uh, sufficiently good with probability q. All right? Right. So I can have a lot of error. And I'm going to still have this probabilistic trust region framework as before. But now, when I evaluate progress, I may be under the wrong uh, uh, impression, all right, so to say. Okay? I have to be a little bit more careful in the algorithm, but not a lot more. Right? So, so um, basically, all I'm requiring is that the model gradient, I will have to be careful that the model gradient my model, uh, my gradient estimate is not too far off from the trust region. So the, re the trust region uh, radius delta k measures, uh, uh, is, is an ingredient of convergence. So I will not allow this kind of uh, models where the gradient, the model gradient is very small and the trust region is very large. I will have to kind of adjust this. So now I can have six types of iterations, successful and successful, true and false, because the model is bad or good and good and bad iterations where the function evaluations are bad or good. So let's see on a plot what can happen. So I have here a 1D uh, plot. The green line is my trust region radius, which is my trust region, my trust region, sorry, where, uh, which in 1D is just an interval, right? So, so this is my XK here. And in red is my true function, right? And in blue is my model. So what I do is I minimize the model Right, I minimize the model, and on the vertical axis is f. I minimize the model on the in this green interval, so I get this this line. If, if this is even a, a linear model here. I, I get this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, dot here is where my sk step will be. Then I evaluate the function. In this case, this this red you know these red triangles are f hat, the function estimates. They are not exact. So I, I measure the progress in these estimates compared to the model decrease, all right? So in this case, you can see that the estimates are close to the true function. So I have true estimates, true model. So I take the step. It's, it's all good. I make progress and, and, and I've, I actually advanced on the true function. When I took this step, when I move here in my algorithm, I've advanced in the true function. What I can do, what can happen is that I can have a bad model. So the function is here, the, uh, the, the estimates, the triangles are close to the true function. So in this case, they are good, but the model is bad. So the step, you know, the step is, uh, um, uh, the step is telling me that the function has gone down, but the function has not gone down. So then when I measure progress in the estimates, because the estimates are good, I correctly detect that actually this, um, this, uh, this, uh, uh, I shouldn't take this step and I don't take the step and then I change the trust region. What else can happen? Well, I can have a good model, but bad estimates, right? So, so again, you know, the, the, the function decreases the true function, the model decreases, but then when I estimate the function, my estimates are arbitrarily bad. So they are far, they are far from the truth and I don't take this, uh, um, and it tells me the function has gone up, so I don't take the step. So I end up with unsuccessful steps. But the di real difficulty in this case is that I can have totally rubbish information. Namely, I can have a bad model and bad estimates. So, so the, I, can I can misclassify. So, so I, the, the, the estimates tell me that the function has gone down and I should take the step and I take the step in the algorithm, but in fact, the function goes up, right? So in a stochastic method, I can, in this stochastic trust region, indeed, I can see true, uh, uh, I can see that, well, I may not be able to see this when I run it numerically, but the truth is that the function, the true function increases. While 
I think that it go it decreases because of the estimates. Right. So can we say anything about this framework? Is it convergent? Yes. So we can evaluate its complexity even, and we call this stochastic transfusion framework storm. Um, we can say that if the function is sufficiently smooth, the gradient goes below epsilon in at most this many expected number of steps. And again, the complexity is epsilon to minus two. It's a classical trust region framework. I don't expect it to be better than epsilon to minus two. The complexity um, uh, changes by, again, a constant factor, depending on the probability of both the model and the function estimates of being good. So they have to be, well, together they have to be greater than a half. However, I'm, the true statement is, this is no longer true for any p and q greater than a half. This is no longer true. What we can prove is that there is a p star and a q star value strictly less than one, such that for any p greater than this p star and q greater than this q star, this result is valid. So this result is only valid if the probability of the model and the function estimates being uh, 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 sufficiently good is sufficiently large. Still less than one, but sufficiently large. And this sufficiently large is going to depend on Lipschitz constants of the problem and, and algorithm, even algorithm parameters. So we have stronger requirements. However, we still allow some positive probability of failure on, on each iteration. So there is no requirement of unbiased noise. We are, allow biased noise in both the model and the function uh, evaluations. And we came up with a novel way of analyzing a convergence of stochastic math, uh, optimization algorithms uh, that look at not just progress in the function, the true function, but weigh it by progress uh, in, a, in a weighted, in a kind of weighted merit function. And based on that, we can quantify this uh, convergence. Um, we have second order guarantees as well. If you have a second order model, I think I'm running out of time here, so I don't want to. Um... Please, uh, don't worry. We, we still have uh, 15 minutes until the end of the talk. And we, um, so it was meant, we were meant to use the last 10 minutes for questions. But we can uh, go five minutes or ten minutes over since uh, there is a lunch break after, so we can be a bit more lenient this time. Okay, thank you. I, I'm not gonna keep people away from from lunch for long. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so um, so we have second order uh, guarantees as well. Um, you need more accurate function values, and this is more tricky. This is much more tricky doing second order convergence. So guaranteeing second order uh, properties. And here we have to actually require something about the expected value of the estimates. We couldn't do it without this. And I don't think it's possible to be very honest. I can detail more at the end if anybody's interested um, where that is coming from. So how could we generate this kind of stochastic, uh, uh, what, what, kind of, what kind of scenarios this, this, this stochastic framework, uh, stochastic uh, trust region applies to? Um, well, it applies to um, uh, stochastic noise, again, uh, sample, sample averaging uh, of function values and uh, construction of models by averaging of gradients, uh, failure to compute accurate function values uh, frameworks. Um, so is there any advantage in Sorry, let me let me just kind of conclude on this framework. So, so what our aim was to was to showcase that classical uh, frameworks, due to their adaptivity in algorithm parameters, uh, allow you to uh, tolerate a large error, amount of error and biased error in uh, uh, in in this in problem information that you use in the algorithm. Um, and we, our aim was to have a general framework that then can fit a lot of other things in, as hopefully I was able to briefly illustrate. Um, and um, does it lead to better numerics? So I'm going to um, 
showcase some numerical results, not that I obtained, but that uh, Katya has and Frank Curtis. Uh, so they've actually looked at uh, running these on some um, uh, problems. So for example, uh, logistic regression on binary classifications. This was just the trust region framework. Um, but with a, um, an adaptive trust region size. The trust region size, so instead of doing a predefined batch size for the stochastic gradient, um, the, uh, the gradient is constructed by, um, by, this, by average, average gradient over a batch, but the batch size is adaptive and the trust region adapts in the run of the algorithm. Um, and so uh, what you get uh, is you get some improvement um, in both uh, um, uh, training and I hope I yes and this and this is the uh, the generalization uh, error um, so there is some they found some improvement but the initial size of the trust region they did have to tune slightly, I should say this. There was some tuning involved in the initial uh, trust region size. Um, then on MNIST, um, there is a bit of, of progress. There is a new paper that Frank did where they looked at doing second order in this kind of trust region-ish framework. Um, the, they do slightly, they are, uh, they do a bit different the trust region adjustment. They do it proportional to the batch gradient. That's why it's called TR-ish, uh, but it's still adaptive. So I wanted to present these results briefly just to illustrate that there are people who have tried this adaptivity idea for algorithm parameters um, and also coupled with second order. And you can see the numerics. The numerics are reasonably encouraging in this uh, new paper that I list there. Um, what we did with my student Alex was we tried to look at just curvature. Is there advantage to adding curvature? And what we did is a little bit at odds with, and not at odds, but a bit uh, different than what I described until now because it's more specific. So what we did was to look at specifically trying to do some kind of Gauss-Newton ideas. So similar to Martin's. Um, um, so a Fisher matrix similar to, to, to Martin's work. Um, and um, what we, uh, so, so basically we ran this KFAC um, uh, approach and uh, which is basically like a Gauss-Newton. So it uses, it, it generates second order information. So, so we just want to care, is there any advantage in doing second order? So we kept, we didn't worry about adaptivity, but we worried about including second order. Um, and what we did is we ran KFAC, but we re-implemented it. We ran, uh, we ran um, a mixture that we came up with of mixing Adam with KFAC. And um, well, as you all know, you know, Adam is pretty hard to beat, but what we also noticed, but, but we did have some encouraging numerics. Of course, if the batch size is small, you know, you cannot do a lot, but if you increase the batch size, so if the batch size is like a thousand, what we found is that this preconditioned atom with KFAC, with second, more second order information, worked well. We looked, of course, at both. We, you need to do tr both uh, uh, training error and to look at generalization error because otherwise it's very misleading. Um, then, of course, you know you, you see a lot of stochastic uh, com uh, error coming in. But we did we did try. I would say reasonably large. We tried to move away from MNIST because on MNIST kind of I think results tend to be maybe misleading somewhat. So so. You know, it's a good thing to try. I'm not saying one is, is good, it's worthwhile trying MNIST, but one should kind of try a bit more. So we tried GFR10, we tried faces. Um, and yeah, um, but with larger batch sizes. We tried uh, autoencoding, and again, this kind of preconditioned 
approach. Of course, we notice sensitivity to learning rate, of course. Uh, so that we tried a little bit to play around with, but we didn't do a lot of overtuning or anything because we just couldn't kind of afford the calculations really. We did a uh, regression um, and this is Gauss-Newton. So um, um, there is an existing approach, GGN, that we tried. We, we were, ho we were at the time we were planning to try this and then we saw there was a paper on it. So we just tried kind of what, what was there. Um, we re-implemented things, of course. Um, and we vary things a bit and this kind of, but Gauss-Newton is kind of similar to KFAC, KFAC with, with Fisher matrix, but it's kind of similar approaches. So, so batch sizes, large batch sizes help reduce the variance uh coming from the you know stochastic uh effects right so so what do i think i think that because i'm a classical optimization person i very much believe in second order information um in the sense that you so easily see with first order method, the, the effect of ill conditioning, the mildest ill conditioning in the landscape will slow down your, uh, your um, first order method. Of course, if you just care about a very small decrease in error, I don't know, I mean, but still, I would say, you know, people then also talk about adversarial landscape when you want to find high accuracy solutions. So then you clearly need to go beyond first order. Um, now, um, second order is expensive. There is no question, but there are these hybrids, right? There are these things in between first and second order where I think very much the hope lies. Gauss Newton, that basically you, you, from first order information about your residuals, you get second order information about the function, um, which are very effective, I, I would say. And we have encouraging experience that this works, but I think that the work there is to just do more on, 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 on uh, the issue of scaling up. And we are, we are working on it. We are working on it. Do I believe in adaptivity? Yes. I don't believe that one should spend a lot of time trying to find a Lipschitz constant, uh, computational time. I mean, I believe that one should allow these algorithms to adapt. Uh, of course, there is a price to pay on the run of the algorithm. On the other hand, it's rigorous. I hope that today, maybe a little bit, I convinced you that allowing adaptivity leads to very uh, rigorous frameworks of convergence uh, with guaranteed complexity results, uh, that this ad adaptivity allows you to recover from bad situations. Um, so uh, there is some numerical evidence from Frank and Katya and their students that this adaptivity uh, uh, pays off um, and uh, more work is needed in numerical developments, I would say, uh, to convince people really um, that this is, this is worthwhile. But this is, this, is where, this is where we are from at least in what we've been doing. Thank you so much for your attention.